afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you join us this afternoon for what I'm sure will be an engaging and informative webinar on how communities and developers can engage their members in the pursuit of affordable housing. My name is Josh Thompson. I'm with the Economic Development Division of the Ministry of Jobs, Tourism, and Skills Training. I'll be moderating and providing technical support for today's webinar. We're proud to partner with the Office of Housing and Construction Standards and many other partners in delivering the second webinar in our second series on affordable housing. I'm joined in Victoria by Roger Lamb, who will be introducing the series and moderating questions for our two presenters, Colleen Hardwick and Gary Pooney, who are joining us from Vancouver. Welcome back to many of you who have attended our webinars before, and for the first-timers with us today, welcome, and we hope to see you again. Before we jump into content, I'm going to briefly run through some tips that will help you get the optimal experience with live meetings. For the best experience, you'll want to dock the attendee and audio and video pane. That just helps get them out of the way so that uh, you just have the screen on uh, the, the slides in front of you and, and not windows in the way. So you want to click and drag the appropriate menu option on the top left hand to the bottom left area and release the pane when the area gets shaded. It's not crucial if you can't get this to work. It is a little tricky sometimes, but it does help sometimes. You can post a question to be answered by the presenter at any time. Uh, just click on the Q&A button in the toolbar on the top left of your screen, type in the question, and hit enter. We'll respond to your question as soon as possible. We hope to have about five minutes of questions following each presenter's presentation, and then whatever time we have left at the end of the webinar today, we'll answer as many questions as we can. But feel free to type them in as you think of them. And you can provide feedback during the presentation as well. So from the feedback drop-down pane in the upper right-hand corner of the toolbar, click the appropriate option from the feedback to presenter drop-down list. And uh, let's just test that uh, right now to make sure that everyone is with me. So just change that to a color uh, other than green right now. And I'll just make sure that that works on our end as well. Great. I'm seeing lots of folks do that. Thank you very much. That's good. You can flip them back to green now. But uh, again, if you're having trouble uh, hearing, feel free to use that uh, to let me know, and I'll see what I can do to help you behind the scenes. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Roger Lamb. Oh, well, thank you, Josh. Uh, so yes, I'm Roger Lamb. I'm a manager in the Housing Policy Branch, and I'm happy to be here today talking or introducing and hosting the topic of Ideas for Engaging Neighborhoods on Affordable Market Housing. Um, I would like to first recognize our incredible partners that we have inside and outside of government. Uh, for this webinar series, we've partnered with BC Housing, uh, the BC Real Estate Institute uh, Association, sorry, the Canadian, Canadian Home Builders Association of BC, the Union of BC Municipalities, uh, the Urban Development Institute, the Ministry of Community, Sports, and Cultural Development, as well as uh, with Josh's team here at Economic Development Division of the Ministry of Jobs, Tourism, and Skills Training. So thank you very much to our partners for collaborating with us on this series. And so we're just going to begin with a quick poll. So uh, what we'd like to do is ask you, including you, how many people are with you today for the webinar? So if you could just please click the button that's appropriate for you. Collecting this, I think we'll take a little screen capture and show you the results. Yes, we're good. Okay, yeah. So it looks like you know there's quite a few people by themselves, but also a few larger groups that are watching us today. Great. So uh, we're going to do our second poll today, which is um, over the past decade, has your community experienced public or neighborhood resistance to infill development or densification? So if you can just please click the one that applies to you. The image there, we see about 62% uh, of people uh, say yes, happens regularly, and about 22% happens sometimes. So I'd say the vast majority of you here are quite familiar with our topic, so uh, should obviously find the presentation very interesting. So um, I'm just going to briefly introduce the topic before getting on to the presenters. So I guess where we 
came to or how we arrived at this topic is that really there's been such an incredible focus on affordable housing over the last decade or so. And we've really seen this in the last uh, couple of months in particular. If anybody out there has been following the municipal elections, it was a platform in many, many communities with many candidates talking about the issue. And uh, it's actually the reason why we started this webinar series, not, not the municipal elections, of course, but actually generally the dialogue that's happening in this province around affordable housing. And this topic in particular is, of, I think, of real interest to a lot of British Columbians because as uh, in, in most of our urban communities, uh, and it's probably a fair comment to say, we're, we're getting to a place where we're fairly limited by the supply of new and available land. And, and in our smaller communities or communities where there isn't a supply issue, we have uh, older or aging infrastructure. And, and many communities have now been looking at the option to, to use infill development or develop inside uh, and using existing infrastructure or upgrading that rather than building out. So I think a number of us in this province, uh, planners and communities and professionals and others, are really having this conversation about uh, where should grow, growth go and, and how should that occur. Uh, so we're really having this, um, this conversation about change and change management. And so, uh, you know, I think there's, it's fair to say that this development is happening, you know, sometimes at a slower pace where you see, you know, a house that might get renovated or updated or changed uh, and redeveloped on a, on a street every week, uh, every, every year, every two years, every three years. But it's kind of on a slower and a more gradual pace. We're also seeing lots of redevelopment where you might have an entire city block that changes or a number of houses being uh, redeveloped at the same time. So different scales and different paces of redevelopment that are occurring. But I think what's really important is, um, is having this conversation about with communities and, and the neighbors in, in particular about how this change occurs and how it affects them and, and how to do it in a way that's constructive and that works for everyone. So I, I think, you know, Without going into too much detail, we can say that a lot of neighbors have concerns about things such as property values, uh, increased traffic or noise, uh, some of the general changes that are occurring in their neighborhoods, as well as safety concerns. So I think what we've, what we've discovered, and I think what we're going to be talking about today as well, is really about a process that allows communities to get engaged and to have a voice and to know that they're being heard and, and that that the plans are being adopted to also suit and meet their needs as well. So uh, without getting much further to the topic, I'd like to introduce our presenters who today are going to talk about this, you know, very challenging but interesting uh, conversation. So our first speaker today is Gary Pooney. Uh, he's, since 2008, Gary's been the uh, president of Brock Pooney and Associates Incorporated. Uh, he's responsible for driving the firm's growth and manage, managing major client projects. Uh, as the president and senior planner, he provides strategic counsel on projects throughout British Columbia. He has expertise in planning principles, policy planning, public consultation, and advanced skills in negotiation and facilitation. He's got almost 15 years of planning-related experience in both the public and private sectors. Uh, in both, in primarily in the cities of Vancouver and Calgary. He's got a master's degree in environmental design with a specialization in planning from the University of Calgary, as well as a Bachelor of Arts in Geography from Simon Fraser University. He's a member of the Canadian Institute of Planners, and uh, he's going to speak today about his experience in building housing and engaging communities uh, in the process of doing so. So welcome, Gary. Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yep, five by five. Okay, perfect. Um, so I navigate my own here, right? Correct? Yep. Those uh, blue arrows in the bottom left. There we go. Got it. Thanks. Um, and you can see me okay, I guess, too, right? Absolutely. Perfect. Okay, good. I'm so glad I wore a different bow tie than the one I was in the picture. Um, so, yeah, thanks, thanks for that intro. I think the perspective that I'm going to bring is from someone who's been um, a part of the development industry. And as uh, development planners, what... Um, types of things that we would want you to know when it comes to public consultation and more importantly when it comes to the overall communication of, of your development projects. So whether it's affordable housing uh, or whether it is a, um, a major development project, the methodology and the thinking when you're getting 
um, word out on the public consultation and communication side for us is the same. So we work with institutions and government agencies as, as well as developers. So to um, tell you a bit more about what we do, to speak more anecdotally, you know, I think people sometimes see us as marriage counselors. So whenever a city hall and a municipal, or, sorry, a city hall and developer aren't getting along, or an agency and a community are not getting along, we get called in to help facilitate. We are also partnered. Uh, we write a lot of the zoning rationale and policy, um, and do a lot of um, more detailed planning work. A lot of public consultation. I'd, I'd say 75% of the work that we do now is largely involved with um, dealing with, with the public. And occasionally we get called in like the Navy SEALs do when there's a situation that is um, gone awry and we're trying to rescue a project at, at the 11th hour. And that happens quite a bit, particularly when something has gone sideways um, from the public side. So that's a bit about who we are and, and what we do. Largely what we are is agents of change. Um, most of you that are on this webinar and, uh, and a lot of the work in the industry as planners, and I've got a, a planning background, are seen as agents of change. And so largely, we're trying to communicate what the benefits of changes to a neighborhood would be, or trying to understand what a positive change could be. And one of the um, stories I bring up, if change was not a good thing, I would still look like this. <laughs> um, this uh, and I'm not referring to the bottom right picture, because that's what I look like now. And the funny one's supposed to be the one with the big bow tie. And you're probably laughing at the bow tie. But it, anyone who's been to my parents' place, my mother still probably has this picture up in our foyer. Uh, so change can be a good thing, um, although in 1989, I thought that was actually a pretty cool look. So what are the top five things that I think that you, you would need to know? And the first one is just reminding ourselves and reminding the public that we're living in a growing, changing region. I'll talk a bit about that. Number two is a question that we always ask ourselves is whether or not we can overcome opposition to change, and can you really do that? Uh, the third, and I know Colleen's going to get into this a little bit later, is the power of social media. That was probably you laughing, Colleen, wasn't it? I think you're the only one we could hear. The, um, the, and to talk about that as, um, as a and quite effective tool. The fourth is about transit density and change, and there's an important story that we try and tell around transit, and the last one is that there's really no silver bullet, and I got some case studies um, on specific projects, and where we try to assess the personality of the project and try and bring that forward. First one, the growing, changing region. So um, most of you who are in the public sector would know that we've had a pretty steady population growth since the mid-1980s. Uh, it hasn't flatlined, it's been quite steady. Uh, those of you familiar with the market in Calgary see peaks and valleys when it comes to population growth and uh, dips and upswings, but it's been pretty steady and it's projected to be pretty steady um, up until 2041. So good population growth, uh, good economic drivers, good in migration still projected for the city and the region historically. Uh, Layer in with that, obviously we're in a very land constrained region from a topographical and geographical perspective and then also from a policy standpoint where we've created an agricultural land reserve um, and, and areas where we can concentrate development and not have development. Uh, within the city of Vancouver itself, a good example is, uh, is um, what's been happening over the last little while. Over the 90s, we were in early 2000s, we were very busy building up the downtown. There were some good sites that were left fallow. Um, some were zoned, some were going through rezoning, but there's a great effort that we put into our, our downtown environment. Since that time, uh, we as a firm are looking at moving into more pioneering areas, which are outside the downtown core. So whether that are new neighborhoods uh, on the other side of the um, other side of the uh, creek, other side of the water, uh, and outside the peninsula, or whether they are elsewhere in the region. So. Um, we, we're constantly reminding ourselves before going to the public that we need to remind them that we're in a growing region with a limited land supply. In the math there is quite quite easy. But what that's leading to from, from um, us as an implementer of policy and zoning and development is that there is a lot of change, growth happening in new areas, which means rezoning applications. And that inherently means change. So that's, that's the um, first point. So in the, the opposition to change, and you know whether or not this is 
this can, is something that you can really overcome. And, and the the N word in our industry around NIMBY it gets gets thrown around sometimes. But it is just reminding ourselves that we there is a population or a group of people um, that may not be uh, supportive or may not be convinced of what we are doing um, it is positive for their neighborhood. Uh, and I don't mean this in a negative term at all, but there is a group of people that we that we typically have been encountering more recently, particularly around the municipal elections. They've been groups with political aspirations. And when it comes to municipal, pol municipal politics and land development, it's a huge, huge lightning rod. And that's something we had witnessed in our industry over, over the last year. Hoping that a four-year term brings some more stability when it comes to people's political aspirations. So that's one part of, of a voice that's supposed to change. But then there's others that are just legitimately concerned and have questions. And um, they want to understand what the impact would be. You know, that is a group of people that we, can, that we certainly try to work with. And there's others that are quite supportive of, of what we are doing, but typically don't participate in these types of meetings. The point I'm making is that there's, there isn't just one constituency. And we, we largely, historically, have been focusing on, on trying, to, trying to convince a group that largely cannot. Um, I just jumped ahead a little bit, but um, you know, reminding ourselves that we, with anything that we've been undertaking, that there's always that resistance. Um, it's perhaps something that may not be overcome. So what we've been doing a lot of is trying to get out to a majority, a majority of um, people that we think are benefiting from the public good. They just they don't show up at public meetings. They, if you send out invites and flyers, and if you just think that they're going to naturally engage in this process, it's very very naive. Um, I've got a young family, and I live in Kitsilano, and I have not been to any public meetings in my own neighborhood. Uh, and it's not because I'm disinterested. It's because by the time I get home from work, I've got my son's soccer practice, I've got homework, uh, and then it's dinner time, then I'm rushing off to do some work, and by that time it's about 10 o'clock. And I try and get as much information as I can online. And when Colleen gets into her presentation, I think she'll talk about how how her tool is overcoming some of that, uh, people who are not um, physically able to be attending these meetings. So what we have been doing is um, proactively doing reconnaissance in a neighborhood and identifying who we think would be potentially benefiting from the work that we're doing. It doesn't mean that we're just off poaching potential supporters. It's, it's talking to legitimate groups that we think would agree with us that our work is a good idea and proactively identifying them and meeting them. So who are these people? I talked a bit about young families who may be benefiting from new policies. Uh, we've had great success in getting out to students uh, who are going to become future homeowners and, and getting them engaged. The local business community has, is, is someone that is quite um, galvanized when it comes to certain causes, but, and so we proactively go after them. Sometimes in a project where we've got a significant public benefit around affordable housing, we go out to agencies or other providers or people who would be um, benefits uh, would benefit from that. And um, largely what we find is that that public, which is the general public, has been quite disinterested in the traditional public meeting format. They do still come to meetings. People still do that. It's still one tool, but it's not the only one. So we've also been, uh, have a bit of a traveling road show and a street team and have set up uh, a core of our staff uh, on certain projects to, to go off and meet people. And we just go off and find them ourselves. And they are anywhere where there's a congregation of a good group on weekends, weekends or evenings, shopping malls, community centers, um, organizing smaller meetings in coffee shops, hitting big fairs that may be coming um, in summers and festivals, uh, even concerts that we've gone off to. It's surprisingly how many people, when you take the information out to them, um, are, are quite um, curious about the information that we're putting forward. Very different than the old traditional uh, public open house format. So some of the other um, approaches, I've just listed off um, a few of them, but these are all things that we are doing. Uh, most of these things I'd say we're doing this month. We're door knocking and canvassing neighborhoods. That's the old school approach. We've identified and targeted certain groups. We're having traditional open houses. We have um, booked out storefronts and set them up as um, venues for a consultation. We're setting up small meetings, about a dozen people at a time, in coffee shops to get into a more intimate um, collaborative discussion. We've, um, we've recently had some co-design uh, working sessions, uh, which would be a, a workshop or a charrette. Uh, we 
are also setting up some kiosks at um, major outdoor events and then, of course, social media. It's very different than just having a traditional open house for a big project and then preparing yourself for a public hearing. Uh, I, I bring this up as an example as um, when it comes to getting word out to people. It's a project we were involved in Abbotsford for Quantum Properties, I'd say about five years ago. And um, they called us. I had that earlier slide about us being in Navy SEALs, and we got a call after the project had been turned down, 5-4. And they came to us and said, our project conforms to the OCP, and uh, we thought we were fine with this high-rise application near the hospital. Uh, I thought it was a quite benefit near this large large scale institutional use, and um, it got turned down. And we got killed at the public hearing. And there was a group of people that called themselves the Sun People um, that effectively ran a campaign against our project and and had um, tough issues at the council meeting. So then we had to dial back a little bit, a lot actually, and have another public meeting, and then went off and started talking to people we think we would benefit from this. And I've listed a number, number of those people there. And after all of that effort and six months' worth of work, it, it, there was some change. Instead of 5-4 in favor, it was 5-4 opposed. The reason I bring this up is that there's um, people will do anything at public hearings, and I'm sure a lot of you have war stories when it comes to comes to these. We had someone who had both public hearings, the failed one and the one that um, was successful, held up her child at the podium and said, if you build this high-rise, my child will never see the sun again. Uh, and in this graphic, the child is so scared of not seeing the sun, she has also pooped her diaper. So there's, there's the dramatics that we have to go through at our own um, uh, public hearings, and, and, um, and the theatrics are at grand levels. Uh, they, this group was also very effective on the social media side, and um, the, the, our team, to be honest with you, was not um, proactive and effective in getting the message out. By the time we tried to, it was too late. By the time we had engaged, it was too late. Uh, you know, I wish that we had had a chance of using uh, PlaySpeak on, on this project because it would have been a very effective tool for us. And there's a handful of other projects that I'm going to list where we have done it. So at that point, I'm going to make your and without taking too much away from Colleen's presentation, is that the social media message, and particularly if it's the wrong message, can multiply exponentially, exponentially um, quite quickly. And then before you know it, the, um, the wrong message has gotten out there. Uh, there's slides not moving. There we go. Sorry, it's just hung up here. Josh, are you there? Hang on a sec. There we go. So, yes, moving now. So, this is the Fairmont Pacific Rim, just to illustrate how um, misinformation can get out um, quite quickly. By the time some of your opponents start talking about a project, it looks like this, and by the time you get to a public hearing, people are referring to it this way. The wrong message getting out really quick, and it, um, it can really um, hinder any of your efforts in terms of getting a positive message out there. So in short, um, how we've been using PlaySpeak and other social media tools is to proactively get our message out. And then number two, um, it's a tool that isn't going away, but it's increasingly popular and it's become mainstream and it's an easy way uh, for you to engage a, um, a large group of people. Very quickly around transit. And, um, and the reason I put this in here, it's a big part of our communication these days and how planners have to become storytellers in terms of growth in the region and change and how um, your projects are, are um, assisting in the overall growth and health of the region. Most of our growth nodes are around transit stations. So we really need to get um, familiar with our transit story. So not only is the access to transit crucial for future development, um, it's a requirement. And on top of that, we're finding in the marketplace, it's one of the big questions we have around um, young buyers who are not using vehicles. Uh, and want good, effective um, access to transit. So when it comes to density and change uh, and communicating the benefits of change, when you're around transit, don't forget that part of the story. Last point is I'm going to quickly run through some um, projects we've worked on. And we refer to this internally about assessing the personality of your project. And each one is different. 
And there's no silver bullet when it comes to, to public consultation. Each project is different, and you need to sort of draw upon your own experience and background to figure out what the best way is to engage a certain neighborhood. Oak Ridge Center was a big one for us. Um, one of the biggest rezonings in the history of Vancouver, certainly over the last two decades, one of the biggest ones. Our approach on this one was to set up a kiosk in the mall. So even I was there personally almost every Saturday, or every second Saturday for about a year and a half. Uh, in total, we had 33,000 people pop by. The open houses had 2,000 people. So you can see how effective the mall model was for us. Social media, we started it off with PlaySpeak, and then the owners of the mall continued with their own social media conversation on Twitter at Oak Ridge 2025, which led to about 50,000 impressions. At the end of the day, with a project that was this big, there were only 75 speakers at the public hearing. And I would say that that was a good success because there was no sticker shock. We were pretty clear about what we were doing and got the word out to a lot of people. Whether they liked it or not, we weren't hiding behind anything. Fraser Mills in Coquitlam, for us, um, was uh, we referred to this uh, project that we did for the BD group. It was about being in the trenches. Uh, there were as a group of people that were very passionate about what the history of um, this site was. It was once a mill town and people lived here. Uh, and the open houses had 300 attendees, but it was the people who had strong romantic attachment to the site, and we were able to engage them, who became our big champions in the community. And we worked with them for about three years. So our approach on this one, in quotes, was about being in the trenches. Marine Gateway, uh, the PCI project down at SkyTrain Station on Canby and Marine. Significant project that had a lot of opposition and our assessment of the personality here was that we think it's being epicentered um, around a few blocks of misinformation. So this was an old school engagement for us where we went door knocking and we had crews of about 20 people and went off talking to everyone about our project. The information was put forward actually, it wasn't promotional, but we were effectively able to get into one-on-one -on -one conversations where it was largely a single family neighborhood. So that was old school engagement. The work that we've been doing for BC Housing on Riverview, I would call as um, new school. So old school and new school. And new school in that we were using PlaySpeak. Um, we, um, I think they're using, we are using our own um, online function through uh, BC Housing now. We're still in process on this one. But the public consultation has been um, quite effective for us. We're mixing in open houses with kiosks at the mall, with a with great um, resource library that is online, and then had an, a, a, an amazing co-design session with Stanley King's group where they drew people's ideas and their aspirations of the types of things that they would want to see here. And now we're in the process of de developing a vision for that. The brewery district in New Westminster, I would, so if one of them was um, the Riverview, I'd call new school. PCI was old school. This one is preschool. And preschool in that we were off meeting with the community before we even had any plans. It was a small neighborhood, a tight community, and we set up a community advisory group and thought that this is, it's almost like it's small town planning where we need to go off and talk to people and introduce ourselves and build, um, build a lot of trust. So we were meeting with the community quite often before we had even developed any plans. So um, in summary, um, I've listed the um, points that I, I had brought up earlier. Uh, just the, the, in general, the, the approach that we've been taking on, on uh, when it comes to public consultation on, on major projects. And that's it for me. Thank you. Can't hear anything. No? Josh, are you there? Colleen, is that you? I can hear you. I can hear... So, sorry about that, folks. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Gary. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, we have no questions right now, and actually, in the interest of time, we're just going to move on to Colleen's presentation, and then we'll take the questions uh, after her presentation for both uh, Gary and Colleen. So with that, I'd like to introduce Colleen. Uh, Colleen Hardwick is an urban geographer, a geographer, a film producer, an internet entrepreneur, and a founder and CEO of PlaySpeak. This is the uh, first location-based public uh, consultation platform. So today, Colleen's going to speak about uh, PlaySpeak as a tool to engage the public and how uh, it helps to positively address community resistance uh, to needed housing projects. 
And so Colleen's going to start with a bit of a, a video for us. So Josh is going to throw that up. And I think uh, you're going to have to actually start the video yourself. Yeah, that's right. So it's um, it's going to load up uh, Vimeo in your in your screen there, and uh, feel free to push play on that video. It will play within the screen, and uh, it's a short video. It's only 90 seconds, so we will see you shortly. Nobody notified me. And welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope that worked for uh, the majority of you, if uh, if not some of you. I'm sure Colleen will be able to provide um, a link to that uh, video when we send out some follow-up materials. If uh, if that didn't work, it was admittedly the first time we've tried it. Um, so we do hope it worked. And I will now pass it back to Roger, who will probably pass it right on to Colleen. <laughs> That's right, Josh. Over to you, Colleen. Um, well, I hope that everybody did get a, a chance to see that. Hi, everybody. Um, because it really sets up the conversation nicely for, for what I'd, I'd like to, to talk about here today is that, that most people in the communities feel like they're out of the loop. They are very suspicious that, that uh, changes are happening without their knowledge or involvement. And so PlaySpeak has been developed really as a step towards uh, trying to, to make it real for people. We do public consultation because it's supposed to provide us with reliable evidence to inform our deliberation and ult ultimately influence our outcomes, whether those outcomes are, are decisions of, about rezonings or development permit applications, for example, or broader based around uh, policies such as uh, community renewal policies and things of that nature. So this feedback loop that we see on the screen right now is really there to illustrate the way that it's supposed to work, but unfortunately it doesn't. Most of the time people feel that decisions are foregone conclusions, they're just doing consultation because it's a box that's got to be checked, and as a result there's very little trust in the process. So. As we've examined this, we, we started to understand that it's important to build legitimacy and trust in the process, which comes from turning that consultation into hard, defensible evidence. So when we started analyzing the, the problem, we started uh, looking at our conventional methods around public consultation. And I don't know if you can read the, the fine print on this. It says, I don't have a question per se. It's more of a 15-minute incoherent ramble. And I think that speaks loud and clear to anybody that's been through the public meeting, public hearing process. It can be quite painful, and as Gary observed, the, the opportunity for the usual ups, uh, suspects to uh, get up on the stage. 
So public meetings, again, not representative, not accessible to, to people like Gary's example with small families. Door knocking, despite the fact that uh, they've got lots of people going out and door knocking, uh, these days people live in condos or high rises and you can't get past, past the lobby or they think it's a home invasion or someone trying to sell them something. So there's a lot of resistance to, to even opening the door to strangers. And then uh, we used to have these things called phone books and landlines that would allow us to pull people within specific uh, geographical areas. But uh, fewer and fewer people have those uh, anymore, especially uh, younger people. So it's demographically skewed towards older people who are more represented in traditional uh, public consultation methodology. So we knew that if we wanted to reach people, we needed to reach them online. But uh, there's you know, just as difficult pathologies around online consultation as there are around the, the in-person side of things. In particular, we've seen the rise of the trolls. Anybody that's dealt with anything controversial has seen the trolls. Uh, and they have playbooks right now, and it's, it's all about enrage, disrupt, and discredit. And trolls can exist in a climate of anonymity, and do, and they can often set up multiple personalities because there's no authentication around their identities. Furthermore, we've seen things uh, like community plans, for example, where the city's done a, a survey, a, a white label, what, what we call white label survey, like a survey monkey survey, and they've observed they've got 1,500 responses, but when they look at the data, over 1,200 are from the same IP address. And this has become a problem because it's without any kind of identity authentication, it's quite easy to skew the results. And that's what one side or the other is trying to do to, to dominate the outcome. Um, and thirdly, we've looked at social media. We love social media for getting the word out. It's a great way of spreading the word. But if you're looking at it uh, for hard evidence, again, you're going to be sadly disappointed because if you're doing sentiment analysis, for example, based on Facebook or Twitter, it's garbage in, garbage out. It's interesting, but it's not going to provide you with what you need, which is hard evidence. So in, in terms of evidence-based decision-making, what you really need to be able to do is to connect digital identity to place and prove it. And uh, that seems like a, a simple process, but it's not for a very important reason, and that is online privacy. We have, uh, under the Freedom of Information and Personal Privacy Act, some very strong rigor around uh, personal privacy. So the solution that we've um, been working under with the development of PlaySpeak is described as privacy by design. And what that means is that people sign up and they verify themselves to place but their private information is not shared with the proponent of the consultation. And when I say proponent, I mean broadly whoever's conducting the consultation. Now that proponent is going to get verifiable location-based data, again, the hard evidence they need, but they never have to touch the private information of the individual. And that's a very, very important part of, of the innovation uh, that PlaySpeak represents. And I should mention that this innovation has been supported for the last three years from our incubation by the National Research Council of Canada. So when you sign up with PlaySpeak, it takes you through a series of, of automated and then opt-in checks to verify that it's a real address, it's at this latitude, longitude, it takes you through an email loop. In the background, we're using uh, services like MaxMind to detect any IP address fraud. We'll see quite often, for example, people might put in a Vancouver address, but their IP address is in China or you know, New York City or somewhere completely divergent. So um, those ones are flagged as, as being offside. It also allows social media like Facebook and Twitter for you to create your account in the first place but it's using Truly You, another Vancouver-based startup, um, to detect any bad actors in social media. And then you can add additional layers of authentication, particularly home phone and, tele uh, and mobile phone, where we're using Twilio in the background, another third-party service. And where you don't have a physical address in more rural locations, we're using a geolocation function that's based on the GPS in, your, in either your computer or mobile device. 
So um, this is an ongoing process of increasing verification, and some consultations require more rigor than others. Uh, we found actually things like cell towers for the telecommunications companies uh, require more rigor. The model that we're working with here is different than what you would have seen traditionally. Instead of setting up a standalone website, uh, PlaySpeak is a two-sided model and a geosocial model as we describe it. So that once people have signed up and verified themselves, they can choose to be notified of multiple consultations uh, according to where they live and according to their preferences. So once I've signed up, I create my profile. Here I am, and I put in my profile that I want to be notified about new consultations one, five, ten, a hundred kilometers from my home. I can also choose by keyword like housing or transportation or education. Anything that comes up that's of interest to me, I will be notified once a week um, or not at all. It's really up to the individual to make those determinations. They can determine their privacy settings. They can determine their verification settings. They can plug in their social media. The overarching um, aim here is to put it in the hands of the individual to stay informed um, and to be able to engage based on their location. Because how do we let them know now? Well, we put up a sign on the property or we put an ad in the paper, we, we send out a flyer, and what we heard, which was echoed in that little animated video at, at the beginning, is nobody notified me, I didn't know anything about it, and I wasn't consulted. So that's really at the core of what we're trying to do here, to let people know in the first place. So. Um, on the other hand, you're the proponent. You're putting up uh, a consultation topic to engage with people. So this is a, a little uh, screenshot of, of uh, a topic setup screen. So you'll put in your team, whether people are, are administrators or moderators, your contact information, and all of these pieces along here are basically fill in the blanks. We've tried to make it as simple as possible so that people like planners don't need to have any specialized IT knowledge to be able to set up and manage a topic themselves. The key things, though, are to determine the scope of participation. So in this instance, the City of New Westminster wanted to restrict participation exclusively to their residents, but internally they wanted to be able to understand how people's opinions in different neighborhoods uh, varied. So each one of these colored polygons represents uh, a different neighborhood in New Westminster. So when they get down to their reports down here, all of the data that they're collecting, whether that's quantitative or qualitative data, whether it's polls or surveys or discussion forums, ideation, uh, user in, uh, input mapping, all of these different functions, when you gather the data, it's all going to be segmented spatially according to the divisions on the map. So when you're thinking about setting up a topic, it might be a rezoning with only, a, a, say, a two-block radius that you're looking at. The starting place is the map. Who do we want to hear from? Do we want to restrict participation and say that nobody outside of this area is available to participate? Or do we want to open it up more broadly? Another example is you might get right down to the, uh, with, within a neighborhood, you might break it into quadrants. Uh, it really depends on what you want to know when you get to uh, the reporting end of things. We've organized uh, our whole approach here along the lines of the IAP2 spectrum of public impact. And for those of you that are not familiar with, the IAP2 is the International Association for Public Participation. And that spectrum uh, goes inform, consult, involve, collaborate, empower. So the first step is getting the word out to people, notifying people. Um, we're, we're building through um, what's called the network effect. Every new consultation that comes on brings in more participants, more users who can then be informed about more, more consultations. So we're building on a growing base of approximately 10,000 now registered users in the Vancouver Lower Mainland, for example, that can be notified as you set up a uh, new topic page. But beyond that, you want to get the word out in words and pictures about what is the nature of the consultation. And I should say that we encourage people to do that as early as possible. Don't leave it um, until the last minute unless 
you're just asking for trouble that way. What you want to do is to get in early and start to describe the nature or the narrative of the consultation. Educate people. You know, what kind of density are we talking about? What the heck is FSR anyway? You know, let people know. So think about it as a narrative of telling the story in words and pictures. And with both offline and online components. So you still want to tell them who to talk to in real life, what events are happening in real life. You still want to spread the word through social media and through search, which is really what drives the, the Internet and the way that people find things. And you also want to include all of the documents, links, photos, videos, everything that you can that helps inform people about the nature of your consultation. The next step is our consult and then involve. So um, you're consulting, you're receiving feedback in a variety of forms. That might be simple polls like you see in the online newspapers, surveys. Um, PlaySpeak has integrated a couple of different survey platforms with more on the way, uh, notably Fluid Survey, which is used by many municipalities in British Columbia and across Canada, but was recently bought by SurveyMonkey. But our objective there is to um, make it possible to use other tools within the PlaySpeak uh, platform an umbrella so that you're able to avail yourself to the, the larger network of uh, and, and growing network of users. Um, there's the notice board for user-generated content. We've seen this used, for example, in Chilliwack when they had a contest for people to upload their favorite pictures of, of Chilliwack or videos. Place it, which is a user input map, which allows people to, to put notes on the map saying, I think the bike lane should go over here, or I think this would be a better location for the park. And discussions which are moderator-led, uh, so you put in the questions and, and people respond and through threads, and they can thumb up and thumb down uh, comments in the discussions. That's more um, uh, bi-directional communication, uh, but you can see the location um, corresponding to the polygon on the map of where people, uh, where their discussion comments are coming from. I should note uh, at this point that because people have signed up and verified themselves to place, um, we have not had the problem with trolls that you will find in, uh, in the free-for-all that is Facebook or, or Twitter and other forms of social media. Uh, we really found that when people are engaging here, they are leading to a much more civil uh, civil kind of dialogue. We haven't had a lot of uh, prof profanity or um, uncivil commentary. When you get down to uh, the end of your process, you're able to export all of your data in a variety of forms, uh, depending on who you are. Most planners or engineers are very happy for an Excel spreadsheet, but communications people are going to want something more in, in Word or, or PDFs. But again, all of that information, regardless of what it is, is going to be spatially segmented. And you're able to plug in your Google Analytics, for those of you that have web knowledge, so that you can track other things like time on site, bounce rate, and, and uh, broadly where people are coming from on the Internet. Um, I should say we've also built other tools that we have an activity map that allows you to drill into any individual polygon and see how you're doing, how many users have signed up, how many uh, discussion questions have been engaged in, how many poll or survey questions have been answered. And then th in that way you can go in and um, target your, your promotion, for example, on an area that might be underserved. And at the end of the day, we really encourage uh, all the proponents to let people know that they're having an impact and that they're being listened to. Again, go in early. You've got the ability through this platform to um, not only be notifying people, uh, but as they connect, entering into an ongoing dialogue with them. Uh, but most most importantly, uh, leading back to that, that original feedback diagram that I showed, it's important to let people know that, that they're being heard. So what we are trying to do in building this platform is to, to build an open and inclusive platform, to make it accessible 24-7. We found uh, very often um, 
An example would have been with the New Westminster consultation where we had 300 people show it up at a public meeting and complete 30 hard copy questionnaires. At the same time, we had over 1,000 people come to the website and complete uh, over 200 surveys. So uh, we know that, that accessibility and being able to reach people online is important. Uh, it's dynamic in that we're receiving real-time feedback. It's, uh, it has transparency as a core value so that, that people can see how, how other people are contributing. It's not like the black box of, of market research panels, for example. And ultimately, uh, the process is defensible, and that comes back to the legitimacy claims that are core to what we're trying to accomplish. So um, a couple of examples uh, before my time is up. Uh, Oak Ridge was one that, that Gary mentioned. This was an early project, um, I think one that we worked on when we were still back in our prototyping phase. But it allowed um, the developer and uh, Brooke Pooney to understand where feedback was coming from online. Um, how people in different neighborhoods were were um, informed or responding. Was it different with the people that were in the immediately affected areas, or was there, there more to be learned from the perspective of people throughout the city? Quite often, just as you might have people bring in a busload of supporters to a public meeting, you get the same kind of thing online. But with PlaySpeak, the importance here is you'll know where those people are coming from, and you'll be able to put them into perspective. No one's saying that you have to discount uh, people because they're outside of the affected area, but at least you know, and having that information is incredibly important to inform your process. Um, another interesting uh, one that, that uh, we were involved with uh, was the uh, Musqueam Block F consultation out at the University Endowment Lands. In this case, if I, I um, was to expand this map, you'd see they wanted to know how people in the, I think they broke it into three or four different zones within the university endowment lands, but they also wanted to know by local area neighborhood within Vancouver and within the 22 municipalities of Metro Vancouver because uh, obviously university, uh, UBC is a destination for all of the region um, even though the, the development would impact people in the um, immediate area. So this was a really interesting one for us to uh, understand as well. And again, the, the data was very valuable to the, 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 uh, the team that was involved, the planners, architects, landscape architects, and the, the PR and con, uh, public consultation people broadly. So um, all of these, I should point out, is we've published all of our findings, all of our case studies on the PlaySpeak website, and so I would invite people to uh, take the opportunity at their leisure to familiarize themselves with some of the learnings that, that we have uh, accumulated. And finally, I just wanted to touch on another one that, that Gary had, which is, is the ongoing Riverview consultation. Again, uh, this was one where BC Housing, the proponent, wanted to hear from people uh, throughout the region, not just people in the immediate affected area of Coquitlam. This one is ongoing. Um, I know that they have been uh, conducting surveys and discussion forums online, but also working together uh, with their offline uh, public meetings and, and open houses and the, the regular kind of activities that that you'd expect as part of a consultative process. The key point being that we need to do both online and offline uh, for all the reasons that we've talked about. And uh, again, with PlaySpeak, we've been developing a tool that allows us to be informed by geography and also to ensure that we're receiving verifiable evidence that's not being skewed by trolls or other people trying to dominate the outcomes. So um, there's some some uh, information if anybody wants to be in touch with me or learn more about PlaySpeak, I'm uh, welcoming to that. So that's it, Josh. Back over to you. Great. Thank you, Colleen, for the uh, great presentation. Um, so now uh, we're going to open it up to questions uh, for the speakers. Um, so if you can just take the opportunity to uh, hit the little Q&A tab at the top of your screen there and uh, write in your questions. We'll be happy to uh, 
to read them out for our present presenters. And, and maybe just to get things going, uh, I'll ask the first question. I know we have a lot of folks on the line today that are from small and rural communities. And I know the focus of today's presentation was largely on larger urban centers and some of the more complex, um, you know, public processes. But for both of our presenters, uh, do you have anything that you'd like to share with the smaller communities and how applicable are the, uh, the tools that you've talked about today? Shall I go? Yeah, yeah go ahead, and start Colleen, and I'll go after. Sure. Um, well, we've seen PlaySpeak used broadly now in places as small as the village of Cumberland on, on Vancouver Island, city of Duncan with maybe 5,000 uh, residents. One of our most active uh, municipalities is Fort St. John up in northern British Columbia, which is about 18,000, 19,000 residents. Um, and they are, they've conducted four consultations, again, realizing that the more consultations you do, the network effect helps cross-pollinate and build up your user base so that you don't have to go and recruit people right from scratch because that's always a challenge with any new consultation is, is how are you going to recruit um, your participants and, again, to be able to provide reliable evidence that you really are re reaching the, the affected people. Um, pretty much everybody's online. If it's if it's not uh, through their their laptop computer, it's through their mobile device. Uh, so the arguments around the, the digital divide are much much less relevant than they were even five years ago. We've looked at, at demographics like age and um, socioeconomic status. We've even looked at homeless people who we've determined may not have a street address, but but have uh, an email address and have um, access to, to being online. So what we're seeing in, in the smaller communities and in rural communities that they are online, they appreciate the ability to be um, consulting online because it means they don't have to drive into town. And that's true also. We've seen that out in um, you know, places like Langley and Chilliwack in the Fraser Valley. Um, there are the people in town are using it, but it's, it's the people that are out of town as well that, that value the opportunity to be consulted without having to drive into a public meeting. And for us, I'd say um, um, Colleen's right. Uh, we've been using social media um, on all of our projects, and just because it's a smaller, more rural or remote community, um, you know, don't think that they're not well connected when it comes to an online conversation. In fact, uh, it could be easier for them if they are a little bit more remote. Uh, some work that we've been doing in Calgary where uh, they've developed a tool uh, for the communications firm for an online open house. So they've been able to get out to um, people in the developing communities on the edge of the city there's been far more participation online than there has been um, in person. <laughs> so that's one point, so don't forget social media. Number two is, if you're asking me um, to help put a plan together in, in a small community and what would we do, social media for sure is one part of it. I would suggest that you still need to get on the trenches and have conversations with people. There, are, there is a group that still wants to come to a meeting, that still wants to meet face to face and may also not be engaged. Like it's our responsibility to get the word out to as many people as possible. Uh, out in um, Cochrane, uh, northwest of Calgary, we went out to an agricultural fair over the summer um, where it's the biggest event that they would be having just to get word out um, about a potential project that we were just starting. And, and what we found is like within a couple weeks, that conversation had spread to everyone um, quite quickly. So there is a bigger effort that needs to be made, I think, in the trenches in, in the smaller communities, and it comes back to assessing your community, assessing demographics, and assessing, um, assessing the personality of your project and your constituents. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we have a question here from David uh, from Terrace, and he's really asking about uh, they recently had a process that was quite successful with PlaySpeak. Um, they had over 600 unique hits but they had a little bit less interest or very little interest in people signing up and engaging in the online discussion. So any suggestions on how to encourage people to use PlaySpeak for more than just a site for information? Absolutely. Um, 
providing them with more to do um, is the is the first thing I would suggest. Um, don't if you've got a series of discussion questions, for example, that you want to engage with people, don't put them all up at once. Put in one a week, and and uh, you know keep notifying people that there's something else for them to do. Similarly with polling questions, um, renew those. Uh, keep it active and and. Um, the other thing is I refer to cross-pollination in the network effect. If you've just done one consultation, that's not enough. You need to do, say, when you get to about three, you really start to cross-pollinate and build up that user base. But it's not going to happen on just one. Um, and that's why we've seen with cities like Fort St. John that's up to their, their fourth and going on to their fifth now, that um, they've been able to continually grow that that user base. So uh, we found also people might come in for something different. They might come in for a school board consultation or a, a transit related consultation or wastewater management, whatever it is. I think um, when, when it comes to municipalities, the, the big recommendation there is um, try and do multiple consultations. That's really what's going to help build your user base. And again, keep once you've got them, Keep them engaged and build on that so that they can see that uh, they actually are having an impact. Um, one more thought on that. I don't know uh, how up to speed everyone is on open data. Uh, governments at all levels are starting to publish data in machine-readable form. So we've been working, our most recent pro uh, project with the National Research Council was our open data strategy. So what we're endeavoring to do now is to, to, to take feeds of, of consultation information. So say it's rezonings. Every time there's a new rezoning application, we can plot that on the map, automate the process, plot it on the map, let people know that that's going on, and uh, again, according to their preferences, and then the proponent, the city in that case, can choose to activate the feedback loop i.e. turn on the, the surveys or polls or discussion forums or not. But it's, it's keeping people informed in the first place that um, will then engage them so that they will continue, you know, move along that continuum from, from inform, consult, involve, collaborate to empower. Great. Thank you, Colleen. And uh, so the next question I think is probably a good one for Gary. It's uh, from Marsha, and I think she's really asking, how does your development team determine which model of engagement to use in a particular community? Um, yeah, I um, partly got into it um, with my previous answer where we're trying to assess the, um, the personality of the project and the personality of the community. Um, and again, there's no, there's no silver um, bullet. We, we're drawing upon a lot of experience. So there's about 10 different tools that we that we can bring forward and maybe we use four or five of them as a part of our project. So use an example, if we're going out in uh, for a development project largely in a single family neighborhood, um, uh, it's probably on the edge of the community. The PCI project I mentioned was a good one. Uh, the, a lot of the people are accessible through um, door knocking. So we do get to people that way. If there is uh, elementary schools, community centers, high schools nearby, we'll try and reach out to them also through advertising because the kids will take notice of home um, uh, to their parents. So the makeup in, so when they do that, we know they're large in a single family neighborhood. That is uh, how we um, would approach uh, a more traditional low density neighborhood. That's on top of an open house, on top of social media. Uh, if we are looking at redeveloping a major or um, mid-sized commercial center and we've got uh, some commercial space on top of the open house and the um, um, other stuff that would be in the trenches, maybe we'll set up something uh, in one of the commercial units and have, and have that set up to augment what we're doing. So the, the standard for us, social media, uh, key messaging, public open house, stakeholder meetings, that happens with all of them. How we augment it really depends on, on, on the community. We have, in big projects, we're involved with the Honest Ed's Mervish Village project in Toronto. And when we went up and met with the stakeholders, 
um, early, just to introduce ourselves because we're from out of town, we also ask them, what's the best way to engage you? How would you like to be informed? And for them, it came back that the open house model um, works, the newsletter drop works, but they largely felt that the more information we could put online would be better. Um, so I think what you do is you determine the, the three or four standards that you uh, approaches that you would use all the time. Uh, and then understanding the neighborhood and asking the public how they want to be engaged, you just augment it. So for us, about half of it doesn't really change. The other half depends on, um, on the environment. When you're dealing with condos and higher density areas, uh, you have to get out to the strata councils that are nearby and proactively go up and meet them. And there's, like Colleen said, there's no way you can go up and, and, um, and door knock with them. So that's, um, hopefully that's, that's useful. Great. Thanks, Gary. Um, Colleen, I just have a bit of a question here for from a local government who's interested in place speak, and I think they're interested in knowing, um, you know, essentially how many months would they need to purchase place speak uh, for a typical type of affordable housing application? And I think you mentioned it in your presentation, but maybe remind us on how exportable the data is, uh, you know, for using in, in different ways of, you know, analysis and so forth. Well, the exporting of data uh, question is it's it's easy. You click on export data and and uh, there you've got it. Um, the amount of time depends on the nature of the project. Sometimes it's a um, you know if this is a single topic, it could be you know three months. It could be a year. It depends on the the nature of the project. Um, Again, if this is a municipality that hasn't done it uh, before, I'd suggest that they should give it as much time as possible and also be looking, as, as I say it, at the potential of, of uh, cross-pollinating with other topics in the area. Because the, the more opportunities that you create for engagement, the greater your results are going to be. But at the end of the day, what I want to be able to see, and you know, I relate this back to days on the Development Permit Board, is I want to be able to see, here's a map that shows the spatial distribution of respondents. And, you know, here's our understanding about how those responses differed by neighborhood, again, depending on the, the nature of the community. But those are, the, those are really the, the great benefits. It's more than just social media. This is, a, this is an analytical tool that's providing you with, with reliable data. So um, I just wanted to put that in there. It's, it's not just social media. Social media is is great, as I say, for getting the word out, but it's not going to provide you with uh, much in terms of reliable evidence. Okay, thanks, Colleen. Um, so I think I just have one more question here that I'd like to ask, and it's one that we've been pondering as we've been looking at these uh, these slides and these presentations. Really, you know, you've been in the, in, both of you have been in the industry for, you know, over, over a decade uh, doing exactly the type of engagement work. Ha have you noticed the, you know, the principles or the elements of public engagement uh, changing over this period of time? Certainly, I, I think the conversations that we hear are different, but have the fundamentals of public engagement changed? You want to go for that, Gary? Yeah, good question. Um, I wouldn't say... I wouldn't say that, that, the, that the fundamentals have changed. Um, but there are some things that are different. Uh, the, um, with the work that we've done, and I talked earlier about us being agents of change, you know, back in the 1990s, there wasn't really a lot that happened in our industry, mid-90s to late-90s. Early 2000s was um, we started having some strong economic growth, good in-migration, and then we had this unprecedented um, growth in the residential market back in 2000 or until about 2008. Um, so it was like a, a huge four-year run. In that four, four or five-year span, there was a lot of change. So if you remember that uh, people were very interested in, a, in, in their real estate, um, development was seen as a good economic driver. There was um, a lot of publicity, publicity and buzz around our work. But what it meant was a lot of change came into our neighborhoods, and I think that there has been some fatigue from that pace of change. The easy sites were gone. Uh, I talked about the downtown sites largely um, have been built up, and they were going off into pioneering areas. 
so the areas, and particularly in Vancouver, and a lot of the inner city areas in the suburbs um, had, that had been identified for redevelopment and growth were largely used up, gone. And that now we're coming in with new policy and rezoning and trying to play catch up. And we are, there's also a deficit in the social infrastructure uh, in certain municipalities as well as physical infrastructure. And what that's caused is a lot of social unrest and nervousness and anxiety around the work that we do. It also leads to a lot of political issues as well. So where the fundamentals of consultation where you go off and go in and seek feedback from people on your development proposal and then bringing forward to a public hearing, those fundamentals haven't changed. The way that um, I think people will perceive uh, the work that we do based on the pace of growth that we've um, had to face over the last decade and the pace of change that they've had to experience is lead leading to a lot of issues. So there's um, a bigger onus that is put on us in the industry and as planners and people working in municipalities on the public side to go off and communicate better what the benefits of this, this change in growth is. So um, and the public is much more informed when it comes to uh, when it comes comes to our work and expect to be engaged um, quite a bit more. If anything that I'm finding that has changed, and, and to be honest with you, it's the political realities of the work that we all have to take on, um, it, it's become a big lightning rod. And the amount of consultation that we have to take um, for big projects and small has, has gone up. You know, we're looking at a minimum of two usually three or four open houses and public meetings, multiple stakeholder sessions, uh, social media companies, um, everything. So where the, um, and then all this comes down to the preparation for a game day political showdown at a public hearing. Like th that whole process has not really um, changed at all. Those bones and fundamentals are the same. I would just say that the amount of work that we've had to do and the and the um, how some of the public views our work is the part that's really different for me. Great, thank you, uh, Gary. Uh, Colleen, did you want to add anything to that? Well, it just I mean, it, how much has it changed? It depends on how far back you go. Um, I think back to when my dad was working on uh, South Falls Creek and uh, in the in the early to mid 70s and and doing the land assembly for for what we now enjoy as as a housing area which at the time of course was a was a an, an industrial area that was fallow and going out of use they i think the big lesson there that that has carried on though is that if you start early and talk talk it through with people involve them in the narrative whether in those days, we had no social media and we had no online. So it was all meetings and it was all in, in you know, having FaceTime with people. Um, that was the way. It was building trust through early engagement with people, educating them and, and working it through. That's become so much more difficult, really, um, in some ways because of the Internet and social media is because it's so fractured and there's so much misinformation that, that is put out there and people have short attention spans and you, you can't really get into any kind of deliberation or, or genuine dialogue around, around things. Um, it's going to be an ongoing problem, especially as we get to legitimacy claims around making these kinds of decisions. Uh, change is the only constant. We are change agents, but we are going to be responsible as planners, uh, whether in the private or the public sector, to be able to um, to really demonstrate that we are making decisions in the in the common good. I personally see with my crystal ball uh, more emphasis uh, online coming around digital identity authentication. Um, I believe within five years we're going to be looking at. Uh, more online decision making, if not right outright voting, we're going to be seeing uh, 
the possibility of doing location-based referenda and petitions online. So I would just be expecting, um, as we look down the line in the future, of how the nature of engagement over land use change occurs, that um, it's only going to become more online as we move forward and change is, as, as Gary has amply said, um, inevitable. Great. Thank you, Colleen. Great answers. Um, so I think we've come to the end of our webinar series, uh, webinar today. We've had uh, some great uh, presentations and some great uh, questions and answers. I'd like to thank our audience again for, for dialing in today and uh, participating. But I'd also like to thank our speakers, uh, both Gary and Colleen, for um, you know taking the time to, to prepare the presentations and come on and, and talk honestly about a, a, quite a challenging topic. And um, uh, for those folks, uh, there's a number of questions uh, about the cost of PlaySpeak. I'd encourage you to connect with Colleen after the call, and I'm sure she'd be more than happy to talk to you about her product. Um, for those of you uh, that are professional planners, just, just a reminder that this is worth 1.5 PIBC organized and structured learning credits. Uh, this is the last of the 2014 webinars for uh, this current series that we have. So. We'll be back in touch in the spring with our new series. But uh, with that in mind, I really strongly encourage you, uh, those who have been on the line watching these uh, over the last year and have a, a really good idea of uh, some topics they'd like to see us cover next year, or maybe if you yourself would like to be uh, a presenter on a webinar, um, Dale Anderson's email address is right there, and you can just send her a note, let her know of your idea or that you're interested in, um, in presenting, and we'd be happy to get in touch with you. Uh, in the next little while as we plan for next year. Uh, I think Dale just let me know that the survey has been sent out, so please take some time and, and fill that survey in. Uh, your feedback is really valuable to us in helping us, especially now as we're, we're looking forward to a, a new season and some new topics. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm going to thank you all for, the, for, for being online with us today, and I'm going to pass it over to Josh. Yeah, thanks again. Um, uh, again, uh, I'll, I'll extend similar thanks on behalf of the Economic Development Division to our presenters, uh, Colleen and Gary. Thank you so much for taking the time to uh, to work with us in, in putting on this, this webinar and also to our attendees for tuning in today.